All right. So, um, like I said before, it's it's always important to understand how light works in real life before you um, you know try to push it. Right. So this is actually a really helpful uh, helpful sheet. Actually, I didn't find this one. My students did showing the exact same. Uh, location in different lighting, right? One on the left is overcast and on the right is direct lighting. Okay. So just kind of noticing the market differences you could see in terms of contrast in the building, right? Uh, one with no direct source of light, one with direct source of light, the contrast and shadows, how you could see the local colors a lot more. For example, here in the concrete versus here when there's a shadow cast, <clears throat> or what is this? Not concrete, asphalt, asphalt. Um, here on an overcast day, you could see how the sky is usually the lightest element, which I've talked about. And, uh, here you could see there's actually a warm light coming in, right? So similar to what we talked about here, uh, sunrise, sunset, it's not labeled on this, but sunrise, sunset is going to be somewhere around here. It's just a lot warmer. The sky is warm, you know, it's purple, it's red. Um, so you you really, it's almost like, a, I like to say it's like a warm Instagram filter, you know, like one of those purple warm Instagram filters. It does affect the color. Okay. So you have to understand how, how it affects the color before, and that's going to inform your color choices, right? So when people ask me like, I have no idea where to start picking color, uh, blah, 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 blah. It always, you always have to start from starting small, right? Even starting from a still life, so, you know, understanding how color affects something like an orange or an apple or a pepper outside and inside, right? That's why I always have people start off with the inside and outside apples and oranges. Um, and then going to more complex subjects like landscapes and whatnot, uh, and just building up your observational skills, okay? That's how you can at least have an inkling of picking, okay, on overcast days, I know that I can pick, you know, more or less the local color of that object because there isn't a strong source of light. So I'm more or less looking at the local color of whatever I'm looking at, right? Now, when I have a direct source of light, is this sun up top, right? Is it noon? Where is the sun's going to be pretty neutral, okay? Or is it sunrise with its warm light coming in? It's much warmer. That's going to influence everything around me. Uh, you you get really purple shadows, as you can see, right? Uh, sunrise, sunset. Whereas during noontime, you can, you know, you walk out on any day, the shadows are very blue. Dapple lighting is very blue. Um, and that's definitely going to influence your colors, right? So that's where you can start. So a lot of people, they don't know where to start. It starts from understanding this from uh, a realist perspective. That's why everyone loves James Gurney's book. I don't mean painting in a realistic way. I mean, understanding things, uh, how they work in real life. Okay. Uh, that's why James Gurney's book, Color and Light is so popular because he breaks that down really well. Um, atmospheric perspective and, and all that stuff, right? So you could see here in all of these, just a difference in shadows when you have direct light. Right. Noticing those things when you go out in plain air is so important. So I love to stress plain air in my mentorship, and I never let anyone skip it, really. Um, so you could see here overcast, just warmer lighting in general. When you have the sun out, you see there's a definite color difference, right? And here it just comes to show um, a lot of people think that when they saturate a color, you don't affect the value, but I hope you guys know that to be not the case at all, right? When you choose that you want to, let's say, saturate your whole painting because you think saturated colors make everything better without paying attention to the value, you're in for a little bit of a dangerous ride, right? Because it indeed does affect the value. Here, we see the local color somewhere right here. Here, we've jumped up into the right. That's slightly darker. So when you're saturating a color, you have to make sure that you're saturating it to an extent that you're not changing and warping the value structure of your painting, okay? Uh, that's something that people don't notice and they just start to saturate everything. <clears throat> so that's just something that uh, I wanted to show you guys. Uh, another thing that is kind of cool, what you guys can do is as you guys get more advanced, um, here's another fun thing you can do, right? Going from 
actual photos to now collecting photo reference from films, um, but collecting different references of different times of day, right? Dawn, morning, noon, sunrise, dusk, evening. That can really help you see how uh, lighting is pushed now cinematically, right? So cinema, the reason why I have my mentorship structured this way is because cinema cheats a lot. It doesn't, you know, it takes realism, realistic lighting and pushes it even more. Okay. So, you know, um, for example, you might not get something this blue. I guarantee you they put some LUT over it, um, uh, you know, and they probably have, um, trying to pick one here. Uh, actually, there's not one where there is some bounce light coming in, but you can even, this is more naturalistic. You can see here in the Joker, there's a kind of a cool source rim light coming in here, but mimicking this sort of indoor cool lighting. Um, here as well, even though the background's dark, there is still a light source on him. There's a top light source on him, but really crunch shadows. So with cinema, what I want to emphasize is that it's so great to study film stills. I mean, there's an, there's an endless amount of movies you can study. So there should never be an excuse of like, I'm done with film, right? Like so many different types of film, black and white, you know, period films, current films to study composition and study color uh, and so much good stuff. Back when I was working at Marvel, our art director actually had us do daily film stills and timed us to five to 10 minutes each. And so I carried that exercise to here. Really, really great exercise. But you could see the level of contrast as you go through the times of day, right? Maybe what has higher contrast, more high key that we learn, right? Maybe something in the morning versus dusk or what is this? Dawn and dusk usually maybe have lower, a uh, high contrast, low key, right? So this would be an example of some indoor and outdoor examples, but just to even kind of track the color arc can be quite helpful, right? You could see it's more neutral here. And then as you get to sunset, you definitely get that warmth, that bloom lighting. And obviously cinema really likes to push the blues and the purples and nighttime. Although of course that is not the only way to depict nighttime. Um, but you know, these are just all fun ideas that you can get ideas off of. So um, collecting and saving film cells and organizing them into this board can be super helpful as well. Uh, so what I want to talk about now is Kind of more about how you can, once you understand how realistic colors work, kind of understanding how you can maybe choose a color scheme. Ignore the website part. I just picked this from somewhere. Just kind of look at the complementary, uh, the different color schemes that you can choose, right? Um, and how you can use this as a guide and believe this movies use this as well to be a little bit more creative with your color. So believe it or not, when you study master paintings, for example, a lot of them might already be using complementary colors or monochromatic colors, right? I'm just going to pull up some, oops, pulled up the wrong thing. I'm just going to pull up some artists right now. For example, this artist right here. He does his, the, all these in gouache. Here, he's using a complementary color scheme, right? Very graphic um, and value structure is very clear, right? Here, it's almost kind of more analogous with the yellows and the greens. Again, we still have that beautiful complexity, simplicity versus complexity, masses versus shapes, giant masses in the back, more complexity in the trunks, right? That push and pull that I talked about earlier. Here, this is actually what you call simultaneous contrast, right? So even though this almost feels like a gray, it feels warmer because that gray what acts as its complement, right? Hopefully this should be embedded in your guys' brains by now for those of you guys who have learned from me with the, a month or so, right? Even though this is almost gray or it's a, it's a desaturated green, it, it already feels like a, a red. Your eye is always going to search for the complementary color 
uh, in grays. Okay.